live from the mist and shrouded mountaintop fortress that is X and Y Communications Headquarters. You're listening to the world famous Mountaintop Podcast. And now, here's your host, Scott McKay. Hello, everyone out there all across the Fruited Plain, and you're tuned in to yet another episode of the world-famous Mountaintop Podcast. My name is Scott McKay, at Scott McKay on Twitter and Parlor, Real Scott McKay on Instagram, Scott McKay on YouTube, and you can find us on the web at mountaintoppodcast.com. If you're not already a member of our thriving Facebook group, please go over right now, put this podcast on pause, and sign up at the Mountaintop Summit on Facebook. You'll enjoy being a part of that like-minded group of men who are all about being big four men, getting the right woman in our lives, and being the best men we can be. With me today is a new friend of mine. We've been chatting for quite a while. We seem like brothers from different mothers already. He is a longtime therapist who is now in the coaching field and is a very interesting cat, and his name is Jed Jerchenko. And he is the author of 131 Creative Conversations for Couples and a whole host of other books. And today we're going to talk about arguing in relationships and specifically how to do less of it or make sure we don't get into those tussles to begin with. So without anything further, Jed, welcome to the show. Scott, thanks for having me. It is an honor to be here. Yeah, man. Well, I enjoy having you on already. As soon as I found out about you and your work, I was excited because I love having guests on who have done significant work in a very specific area, especially when we haven't talked about it on this show ever before. And the whole idea of arguments and I guess, you know, conflict in relationships in general is something we don't talk about enough around here. And it's not because we believe everything is always happy and sunny in relationships all the time. But, you know, it's yet another topic in a very deep field of potential things to talk about when it comes to women in relationships that we just haven't gotten around to. So I'm glad you're here to kind of get started. You are a California native from San Diego, and you're now living in Minnesota. So uh, the first thing that came to mind was a Chris Cornell lyric from years ago about looking California and feeling Minnesota. And that's pretty much you, isn't it? (laughs) Uh, Absolutely. I made it through my third Minnesota winter and I've learned the words. I learned the language. I now say things like oofta, oh dear, and don't you know. (laughs) All those uh, lines made famous by the movie Fargo to everybody else, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Just don't buy a wood chipper and you'll be fine. (laughs) (laughs) All right, man. So uh, talk to me about your work with couples and helping them argue less. How did this become a touch point for you that you really wanted to spend a lot of time figuring out and giving solutions to for a lot of people out there? Yeah, Scott, this really came out of my own journey. You know, I spent first 10 years of my life as a children's pastor and I graduated from seminary thinking I knew a lot about relationships, didn't know what I didn't know, went through that whole I kiss dating goodbye era, had this perception of man, if I follow this purity movement, I'll meet the right woman. Uh, We'll get married. We'll live happily ever after because that's how it's supposed to work, right? Yeah, right. It's supposed to be a Cinderella story and nothing but daisies and rainbows, right? Yeah. And it ended up that my first marriage was just an absolute train wreck. And I didn't know what I didn't know. And Not only that, I fell into this nice guy syndrome, this kind of internal belief that if I'm just nice enough, everything's going to work out. And I bet you already know how well that worked for me. Oh, women will just slay you for being that guy, even if they're sane. Absolutely. So my first relationship was just a disaster, but I knew I wanted to be in a good, healthy relationship. And so not knowing what I didn't know, I went back and dove into my own studies took me back to college, where this time I studied counseling and psychology. I jumped on Amazon, ordered every relationship book that I could find, because I said, I've got to figure this out myself. And part of that was learning how to even just enter into a relationship, knowing how to be able to see a girl that I wanted to date and just have the confidence that, man, I could ask her out. I could not end up in the friend zone. And I can take this relationship further when that's what I want want to do. And it's the same thing with arguing and fighting. You know, the whole goal of 
I would say this conversation isn't to say, hey, let's learn how to completely avoid arguments. It's that idea, that confidence of, man, when this argument's done and we need to reconnect again, I know how to guide us there. Does that make sense? Yeah, it absolutely makes sense. The way I would think about it is it's Pollyanna-ish to think that as a couple, you're never going to disagree about anything. And whenever I see a couple and they say, oh, we agree on everything we ever discuss around here, I'm thinking someone's manipulative and in charge and the other person's being passive and quiet, dare they ever disagree. Yeah, there are rare situations where couples are just absolutely on the same page about everything. Emily and I come pretty close to that. But when we do have disagreements, and we indeed do, the key to me, Jed, is we're never ugly to each other. We always trust each other. We still adore each other. We may hash it out. We may even get cranky with each other. But we're going to come to some agreement. It may be, all right, you know what? We're going to do it your way this time. But I think we're being dorks for not doing it my way. But I just don't want to argue about it anymore. Fine. Let's have Italian tonight instead of Chinese. You know, <laughs> That's the basic gist of it. We have at our core a common belief system. Emily and I think the same way about those things that drive who we are, our personalities, how we make decisions, where we go on vacation, the kind of food we eat, the God we pray to, the lever we pull in the voting booth. So that means there are never these fundamental differences that are going to create deep rifts that we're never going to resolve because neither one of us are going to change our minds. Invariably, when we argue about something, it's something procedural or something that we're either in the mood to do or not to do, and we get past it. But we don't ever call each other names. We don't ever insult each other. And I can't think of a single time in 15 years where we've said something we regretted later because of any resentment that would be there because, you know, you just will never see things my way. And I got this stuck in my cross somewhere. <laughs> Scott, I, I love that. And as you're talking, you know, I'm thinking of my own journey with Jenny. We are 10 years, 10 years of knowing each Hold other. Hold on. Wait, what? You're Jed and Jenny Jurchenko? Jed and Jenny Jurchenko. Yes. We got the J's going. And your middle name starts with a J, you told me. Middle name is John. Yep. Starts with a J. So JJJ or J cubed. Wow. And you have kids? And we got kids. Are they J's too? Four girls, no J's. That was like okay. one of the conditions is, honey, we are not doing this JJJ thing. No Michelle's with a silent J or anything like that. <laughs> no, nothing, <laughs> nothing like that. I apologize, but that had to be tossed out on the table. Uh, continue, please. Yeah. So your story, what it made me think of is Jenny and I, we never argued a lot, but as our relationship's grown and we've grown and we've matured, it's reduced. And I think what you hit on was key is coming back to that connection piece. And in my mind, you know, if you argue, if you fight, some couples, they've just got that natural, quiet personality and they can fight and you don't even know a fight's going on. Some couples are loud and boisterous. And when they argue, like everybody knows they're arguing, neighbors know they're arguing. Uh, John Gottman, researcher I love, says, man, if you're going to argue, do it in your style. If you're soft and quiet, be soft and quiet. If you're loud and boisterous, be loud and boisterous. The key is, is that the two of you are coming back afterwards and you're connecting and re-engaging. I think that's so true. That's certainly been true for us and our story. And it sounds like it's true for you guys too. Well, the caveat there that I think is necessary to issue is if you're going to be loud and boisterous arguing, don't have neighbors in close proximity because when the police come, they will arrest you as the guy. That's what's going to happen. Yes. Yes. Fair enough. No, I would agree with that 100%. And I would add to that a few things because you had said, hey, no name calling. You know, <laughs> the same same research says, you know, there's some kind of atomic bombs that you can drop. You know, the criticism, the contempt, the blaming, um, the stonewalling, those are kind of atomic bombs that are just going to last long after the the argument's over. It's almost like that radiation effect where argument's done but you're still feeling that pulsing effect. Now, if you're disagreeing and the problem's the problem, the other person isn't the problem, when the argument's done, it's done. You know, if Jenny is mad at me because I'm home late and lateness is a problem, not me, not my character, but lateness, fine. You know, she can say, Jed, I hate it when you're late. I miss you. I wish you were. Well, that actually draws us closer. 
She's mad. Her anger is up there. She's frustrated because I wasn't home. But I'm not the problem. My character is not the problem. It's lateness. And she can yell and scream about lateness all she wants. An hour later, that's not reeling through my head of, oh my goodness, I can't believe she would say that about lateness. You know, if it's me and it's Jed, you're this, you're that, and it's my character, an hour or two later, that still stings. Yeah, absolutely. Because when there's a habit that grates on your partner, if you're a good and reasonable person and you love your partner, you'll want to grow in that regard to promote a happier relationship. But the prerequisite there is that your partner is a good and reasonable person herself. (laughs) You know what I mean? So I agree with that a thousand percent. And of course, the best way to increase your chances at having that be the foundation upon which that part of your relationship is built is to choose the right woman to begin with. If she's unreasonable and there's a double standard or she's got this vicious jealous streak and she's blaming you for things you're not even doing or wait for it, she's batshit crazy, (laughs) run away. And these red flags are usually there whether we choose to see them or not. And we've talked about that before on this show, by the way. So No sense in flogging that dead horse. But when you have two people in a relationship who are of sound mind, they're optimistic, they're generous with each other, and they're trying to make this work. When one partner comes to the other with a complaint such as, hey, you know what? You're habitually late and it's starting to get on my nerves. The other partner will typically not feel the need to get defensive. They're going to say, hey, you know, this person, my partner is coming to me with a desire for our relationship to be made better. Am I going to partner with her in that, in the true sense of the word, to make our relationship better? And is this a two-way street? Are we being reasonable with each other? Or am I going to ignore it to the peril of this relationship? Mm, I love that. And I touched on this a little bit earlier when I told my story. When I think of this whole idea of ending arguments, we can dive into tools like that whole tool of, hey, make the problem the problem. But I think even more valuable is even diving into some of this internal framework, which was a big shift for me. And I think you'll know what I'm talking about because my internal framework initially was this idea of I've got to be nice, which for me is kind of that motto of please and appease. And if I'm just nice enough, things are going to work out. And what I've learned is to make the transition to at least what I call good and kind. It's that person that holds on to his values. You know, a good guy One, stands up for his woman, his family values, is a man of honor, but holds on to those values, even if it upsets other people. And then, of course, the jerk is just rude and obnoxious. And so that's kind of my three-part framework is, hey, is this coming out of this niceness, this, um, hey, there's an argument, I feel like my whole world has been flipped upside down, and I've got to please and appease? Am I acting out of being a good, kind guy who's holding to his values? Or am I just being a jerk? I think that's fantastic because you've brought up this magical scenario that I've talked about frequently where a lot of guys are told that they need to stop being Mr. Nice Guy and start acting like a jerk instead. And that's a false choice. I was just going over this yesterday afternoon with someone on a coaching call. Being this good man of character that you're describing is not only what's going to make a long-term relationship with a woman better, it's also going to be more attractive to her. Because Mr. Nice Guy, you know, it comes down to if you can't stand up to her, you can't stand up for her. And that feels slimy to women. It's like this guy isn't a provider and a protector. You know, I can boss him around. I own him. Therefore, if something really happens around here where I need a man in the house, he isn't going to be it. But meanwhile, if you let the pendulum swing all the way to the other direction, what happens is you're just a jerk. You have ill will. You have bad intentions for this woman. And some guys may look around and go, hey, wait a minute. You know, these jerky guys are getting pretty girlfriends, but they're not getting pretty girlfriends with good, solid self-esteem. They're getting women into their lives who have this feeling that somehow they deserve to be punished or that they deserve to be mistreated. And if you check in with those couples the jerky guy and the low self-esteem woman, a few months later, you're going to realize either they're not together or their relationship's a disaster. So again, it's a false choice. The way to be is this big four man I always talk about who's got good, solid character, who is confident, masculine in the way women define it. In other words, he provides, protects, presides, right? The way the Mormons used to put it, for better or worse. And 
makes a woman feel safe and comfortable by being that masculine presence and is trying to do the right thing. This is what makes women respond powerfully to a man from a short-term perspective of just visceral sexual attraction. And the bonus, as it were, is that the long-term relationship is that much better also. Yes. And here's the problem. I just realized this today before jumping on the show, because I was doing my kind of going to call it my Google research. I started by... (laughs) God forbid. (laughs) Yes, yes. But I wanted to see what people's perceptions were of nice guys. So I said, okay, what are some nice guys out there? And there was this common perception that you don't want to be the nice guy, you know, the guy who's in love, but ends up in the friend zone. And common examples of nice guys were Ross Geller from Friends, no surprise there. Um, Ted Mosby from How I Met Your Mother. And spoiler alert, if you haven't seen it, you know, end of the show, Ted's telling his kids, and that's how I met your mother. And the kids are like, yeah, but dad, you're really in love with our Aunt Robin, and this whole story is about her. And he's like, oh, yeah, you're right. You know, and then um, Leonard Hostetter from the Big Bang Theory, you know, just kind of these wimpy guys who aren't going after their heart. But then when I Googled good guy, kind guy, pulled up an article that said, you're not going to find a lot of movies because typically these guys are are boring unless there's some other conflict in there. So guys I came up with are like William Wallace from Braveheart, you know, Maximus from Gladiator. But those are the hero guys. Those are the good guys. But typically you won't find a show about a good guy and a good relationship. They make it through and it's kind of boring. Right. There's no ironic humor in being a strong masculine guy. (laughs) You know, it's everybody loves Raymond and the Honeymooners and the Flintstones. These guys who want to pretend like they're, you know, these macho guys or that they're doing the right thing or whether they're nice guys or, you know, ironically rough and tumble guys. Either way, they end up being wimps and it results in utter hilarity, regardless of what the TV context is or the movie context is. Yet, you're right. I'm thinking of the movie The Good, Bad and the Ugly. Okay. Well, is Clint Eastwood's character really a good man in that movie? Or is he just, relatively speaking, better than the other two? (laughs) The bad and the ugly. I mean, we're kind of left scratching our head going, wait a minute, what does being a good man of character really look like? And what it comes down to, I think, is more like the outlaw Josie Wales character that Clint Eastwood also made famous, which is, okay, these people came in, they're threatening my family, they're killing my family. I'm going to go avenge that because I love my family and I want to do right by those people who are depending on me to do right, et cetera, et cetera. And yet Josie Wales, of course, is a flawed person. Uh, You see this in Westerns a lot, you know, like True Grit, especially the original version with John Wayne, where the teenage girl comes and says, you know, you have True Grit. I need you to come help me avenge my father. And he's like, yeah, you know, go away. I don't have time for it. And then John Wayne finally realizes, hey, you know what? This is really screwed up. And I am the man who's going to go make this right. And there's a lot of shooting and cussing and spitting tobacco and being really rough around the edges, but the beauty of that movie and indeed of the original book, the spirit of the original book that inspired the movie is that this young girl is made to feel safe and comfortable vis-a-vis her hero, who is this rough and tumbled, nasty guy. And it really does challenge your perception of what's good because Mr. Nice Guy is either walking on eggshells trying not to lose someone who he's not really sure he actually deserves because of his own self-esteem issues, or he's trying to be manipulative and sugary sweet and fake to get something he wants without a whole lot of positive concern for the other person. Those are the two shades of Mr. Nice Guy that just really make women skin crawl. And so when a guy shows up and is like, okay, Here's who I am. Here's what I'm about. I'm choosing you to spend time with as a woman because I'm attracted to you. Yes, I'm horny for you. And I just like you. I prefer you to the other women who I could theoretically go out with. You could take it or leave it. Or, you know, I hope it goes well. But if it doesn't, you know, you have choice in this matter. Women are like, well, okay, now a real man has shown up. And they can handle the truth. And it just seems like what the world needs a lot more of up front, Jed, it's good old fashioned honesty. 
Because when these guys were walking on eggshells like Mr. Nice Guy, fearing loss and trying to reel in the biscuit with a woman by not being honest and trying to pull the wool over her proverbial eyes just so she'll be with him. Boom. I mean, go figure. That's going to be a relationship replete with constant arguments, probably over what seems like nothing, but comes down to these people have never been honest with each other. Imagine that, right? I love that word of honesty, because I think that's the key characteristic of that good guy, that kind guy, that man of honor is you can be honest. You can hold on to your opinion. And I would say for my wife and my four daughters, there's a lot of safety in that. You know, if I can hold on to my beliefs and my values, even when it's uncomfortable, even when they disagree, you know, if my opinion hasn't changed and I can hold on to that, what security? Because they know I love my family. They know family is a huge value for me. And just the fact that I can hold on to my values, they know, hey, if somebody comes over and tries to convince Jed that family is not important, he's not going to let go of that value either. That's amazing. You know, earlier you were kind of alluding to this idea of resentment simmering over time, taking hold and then rearing its ugly head suddenly in the midst of a later argument. And that is really a major sign that there hasn't been a whole lot of honesty. Mm. Isn't it? Yeah. I would say a good guy, a kind guy, a man of, he can live in the tension. And um, with my therapy background, one thing I've noticed is therapy years ago, you know, it used to be all about communication when there was arguments and conflicts between couples. And you probably heard the pattern before. One person's designated the speaker, other person is designated the listener. And the process was the speaker would speak, the listener would repeat back to them word for word, and then the speaker would check for understanding. And so it was really creating clear communication, taking the heat or the tone and bringing it down and really bringing a lot into the intellectual. And a lot of couples would eventually come to an agreement and they would leave. But what we found is that over time, these relationships where there used to be loud arguments, well, they were now dying icy cold deaths. Couples were divorcing, but they were doing it nicely. We're finding couples were arguing better. They were arguing nicer, but they weren't really reaching an agreement. One person would give in and then hold that underlined resentment, and the two would drift further and further apart. So, you know, agreeing to be nice, agreeing to end the argument. From what we've seen, that doesn't seem to work. Now, one of the things that you mentioned as a bullet point you wanted to talk about on this show is your strategy to stop arguing in a relationship. So I'm assuming that would be something the opposite of what you just talked about. So go ahead and describe that to these guys. Yes. So if I were to give one strategy, one strategy for stopping an argument more than anything else, I'm going to say it's going to be to create connection moments throughout the day. And so I'll give you a couple examples of exactly what this looks like. I'm a writer. I love to write. And for years, my habit's been wake up at five in the morning, brew a pot of coffee, go to the kitchen table, open my laptop and write. A couple years in, my wife, Jenny, who is absolutely amazing, came to me, said, Jed, I love that you write, but when you get in your zone, it's like I don't even exist. Now, we've got four kids. For me, that's a strategy. You know, if I've got four kids running around and I'm going to get any work done, I've got to be able to tune everybody out. But it was getting in the way of a relationship. So I used the same habit building strategy I used with writing. I said, hey, I'm going to set a trigger. First time I see Jenny in the morning, I'm going to close my laptop. Two of us are going to connect. Sometimes it's for a minute. Sometimes it's for five minutes. A couple times it'll, you know, go into the half hour, hour. But for Jenny, that means the world. I'm showing her, hey, you're more important than any work that I'm doing. Now, she's always been more important, but that goes to her heart. Now, this has become a pattern in our relationship where first time I see her, it's not just a trigger for us to connect in a positive way. She comes home from work. One of the first things I do is, man, we're going to have a 30-second connection moment. I go away, run an errand. Next time I see her again, it's a positive 30-second connection moment. Now, here's what that does. We've got these connection habits built into our day. If there's a disagreement, 
and there's that frustration building and we miss one of those connection moments, man, it feels weird. We miss two of those. It starts to feel really weird. And both of us are really tugging to get back to happily connected. That's our baseline. That's our norm. And when you can establish that norm in the relationship, it makes a long drawn out argument a lot more difficult to have. Well, what comes to mind there are two things. The first one is I talk often, Jed, about connection between a couple, obviating the need to talk about the need for conversation Mm. in a relationship. Uh, A lot of times marital counselors will be like, oh, you two need to communicate better. You need to have better conversations. You need to talk more. I think when a couple actually connects, and by that, I mean they get each other, they know what's going on in each other's minds, respectively, they tend to communicate better automatically because they understand each other. I mean, I've said this before on the show, but for your edification, I'll get guys who come to me in a coaching context, Jed, and they'll say, "Uh, my wife of six years said this last night. What did she mean by that? And my answer is always the same. I don't know. Did you ask her? (laughs) And they're like, oh, I could never do that. And I go, well, sir, you have no connection with your wife. You don't understand each other. And at first, a lot of guys push back on that. and They don't want to hear it. But if you can't even ask your own partner, what did you mean by what you just said without fearing loss there? Then A, that's back to the Mr. Nice Guy tendency. B, you're never going to have any resolution to whatever it is she's trying to talk to you about. And that to me seems... Very, very important. The other thing that comes to mind, I said there were two things. The other thing that comes to mind is because you're connecting with each other already, you're going to get rid of those underlying simmering things that are unsaid such that when an argument starts, that argument isn't really about what she's saying the argument is about. It's about something completely different that never got dealt with, that simmering Mm -hmm. thing that happened before. Key example, a very broad example, but a key one that comes up for a lot of guys that a lot of guys are going to resonate with is, you know, I got a wife who nags me, you know, you didn't take the trash out. You didn't do this. Well, it isn't so much the trash as almost invariably, she feels like you're not being the man in this relationship and she has to do too much of the providing and protecting and presiding. And she's getting irritated about it because you're becoming less attractive to her. So she's getting a little hot under the collar. Now, she may not even understand fully. You know, it may not be something she's cognizant of consciously that what's really getting at her is something that much under the surface. In the moment, it's the trash or it's you didn't clean up after yourself or you watch too much football. But it's not unlike when a woman doesn't take care of herself or she's not making any effort to be feminine, that the guy will, for example, not want to have sex with her anymore because he's not attracted to her and waits for her to leave the house so he can jack off to porn to get his rocks off because he's not attracted to his wife anymore. And after he does that, his wife comes home and he's mad at her and she doesn't know why. Like, why are you being so irritable towards me? It's like, "Mm, I don't know. I just leave me alone. And he goes and retreats into his cave. It's the same psychological condition that both men and women can have. And it just creates very confusing, dishonest arguments between couples, frankly. Scott, I love those examples. I'll be honest. Those are tough ones. You know, when you're in a relationship with somebody who nags and you want to retreat to your cave, that's when I would really encourage guys even to go back to that three-part model of what's a nice guy going to do, what's a good guy going to do, and what's a jerk going to do. You know, and if you look at that, Probably the nice guy is going to say, hey, one, I'm either going to retreat to my cave and just hide out there indefinitely because I'm afraid of an argument. The jerk's going to fire back, going to start the argument, going to start poking and prodding. Good guy, kind guy is going to find a way to flip it on his head to change the game. And it might be elevating the temperature of the home. Um, The language I would use is being that thermostat and not the thermometer thermometer in Minnesota, it reacts to the weather. The temperature goes down, thermometer goes down. Thermostat sets the temperature of the home. And so it's like, okay, she's upset about the trash. I may take it out now. I may take it out later, but I'm also going to raise the temperature of the home too. I don't have to get sucked into the negativity or the argument. Can I use some humor? Can I somehow turn this into a connection moment? 
And that's not easy. But a good guy, a kind guy, a man of honor is going to figure out a way to do it. It might be putting on your best manly voice and saying, hey, honey, I got this. But whatever it is, it's going to be jumping into that leadership position, changing the tone, and doing it in a way that fits with your values. Now, just to make sure everybody's clear here about what you're talking about, you're using this phraseology of raising the temperature by being the thermostat. And I'm thinking a lot of guys are going to hear that and think, get hotter, raise your voice, be angrier, stand up for yourself. Is that what you're saying? I don't hear you describing that concept quite as such. Yeah. So I'm saying, hey, let's make the relationship warmer. It just got cold. Let's heat it up, you know, not in an angry way, but let's just raise the temperature of the home from cold and frigid and icy to, man, we're warm and comfortable again. But we're not going to do that by pleasing or appeasing. We're going to do it in a way that fits with our values. And again, that's a challenge. It's not easy to do, but it's really what we're working towards. I think another aspect of this, if I may be so bold, is that it brings up this idea that's talked about often around here of strong vulnerability, Mm. taking risks. And I don't think it's fair for the man in a relationship to expect the woman to be the vulnerable one first and to take all the risks. And that sounds very ironic to a lot of men. But an example that I could point to to kind of illustrate this vis-a-vis the example you gave is, okay, what is this really about? If she's getting way too energized about something that's super simple, it takes a lot of guts to throw on the table that we need to dig into this. I'm not going to run away from it. I'm going to hit it head on. And to do that in a calm, loving way where you say to her, hey, you know what? I want to know what's going on here. I mean, obviously... If you're both so energized that you're hot under the collar, doing so in the moment probably won't be the right thing to do. But there comes a time where you're going to have to say, all right, you keep bringing this thing up. You get really angry about it. And I feel like I've already corrected it or I promised you I'm going to do better, but you still are harping on this thing. So what is this really about? But the danger there, Jed, is like I alluded to before, she may not even know. Mm. it may require some digging or maybe even some talk with a third party like a counselor. Yeah. So that curiosity, though, is what I hear you saying. I've got this word that I love. So it's the word intimacy, but bringing it down into (laughs) into me see the idea of peering into your loved one's inner world and hey, what's going on with their heart? Where is this coming from? Yeah. And I know right now, um, sometimes the answer to that is simple. Sometimes it's just COVID and stress. You know, you bet more stress there is, the easier it is just to have our buttons pushed and we're safe at home. Sometimes the end of the day, that stress is built up and it just comes out blah, you know, and that's a time where you might even use the strategy like the do over of, hey, I think we're just stressed tonight. Can we just take a do over? Can we restart? Because man, sometimes in these crazy times, couples need that and families need that. I would interject there, and this is going to be a bit of a tangent, but brief. You mentioned COVID and people being stressed out and having a bit more of a hair trigger in general. Guys, understand that. As you live, move, have your being with women, with other dudes socially, you may run into a situation here and there nowadays in the current environment where people are just a little edgier than you remember them being. Be the agent for calm and be the agent for grace in that environment. Don't get sucked into it. I mean, I've had at least two situations in my personal life this past week where I've had to just walk away and be the guy who decides that this shouldn't be escalated and I don't know where this is even coming from, but I'm not going to get defensive about it. I'm just going to chalk it up to COVID. And, you know, the next time I see the person and next time I talk to the person, they've calmed down and we, you know, it's as if it never happened. So take that one to heart, guys. (laughs) <laughs> love it. I love it. And our whole family uses that strategy some nights because there are nights where Jenny and I are, we look at each other and we ask each other, what's going on with the kids? We think, man, we just need to put everybody on a timeout. Then we look at each other and we're like, us too, this, we've not been behaving at our best. And really everybody deserves to, you know, just be sent to the rooms and go to bed early. Instead, we gather everybody together. We say, this has just been a disaster you know, disaster of a last couple hours, disaster of a moment, we're restarting. We're doing a movie, we're doing a popcorn. After that, it's a fresh start. 
And it's really our monopoly get out of jail free card. It's not something we use all the time, but man, there's moments in your relationship where it's, you just need that do over. Have you ever been there? Absolutely. And you know what? Not only that, but I think there is a do before, not just a do over. What do I mean by that? Well, it comes down to the honesty that we've talked about time and again on this show. In our family, we are proactive, not only to say we love each other, but that we like each other. And Mm. the four of us who are still at home here, I mean, my two older ones are out of the house and doing their own thing. But my two youngest and Emily and I tell each other we like each other. We tell each other we're proud of each other. And we've earned the trust between the four of us in this house, which you've also talked about, and rightly so. Such that if we get cranky with each other or we're displeased with each other, we let the fur fly because there are no hard feelings. We're not calling each other names. We're not saying, I don't love you anymore. We're not saying, I can't stand you. Or even, I can't stand you right now. It's more like, as an example, okay, what you just did really irked me. Well, screw you, I'm not going to do anything about it. No, do it. Get it done. Do the right thing here, or we're going to remain angry. And they're like, okay, okay, okay. (laughs) Now, one of the things that has not been said yet on this show that might be important to talk about for those guys out there who are parents is whether you like it or not, so goes your relationship with your wife or your girlfriend, married or not, relative to the kids in the house, relative to this concept of trust, honesty, arguing, getting each other, so will go your relationship not only with your kids, but between your kids. And whether you like it or not, this is going to be hard for some guys to hear. If you're out in public with your kids, those kids are going to wear it on their sleeve. They're going to treat each other out in public exactly the way you and your significant other are treating each other at home. Bank on it. So when you see kids out there going, I hate you. I wish you never would have been born in public. That's how mom and dad treat each other. That's what's been modeled. Now, see, in our house, we can bicker. We can say, I'm pretty much sick of your crap right now. Stop it. Or you didn't take the trash out. Well, I meant to. Oh, stop complaining. Do it. All right. All right. And yet, They've heard, I like you, I love you. They've heard honesty about what they do right and our honest feelings towards each other enough that we don't take it personally. It's all in a day's work. It's that honesty, that transparency. And I don't know about you, Jed, but I grew up in a home where my parents meant well, but there just weren't enough parenting resources or whatever back then. And in the process of attempting to mean well, they sugarcoated everything. You know, we dare not say anything bad or say I'm having a hard time. It's just paint a happy, smiley face on this. And, you know, we're not going to allow anything otherwise. In retrospect, that doesn't seem honest enough. I'm going to say, I can't think of any bigger motivation, you know, for being that man of honor, for speaking openly, honestly, and living life out loud, but also coming back to that politeness and respect, then this is what I want to pass on to my kids too, is they're watching all the time, especially when we least expect it. Yeah, 100%. 100%. That's important stuff. I hope that isn't trivialized by the guys listening. That's the impact that the tone you set as a man for the relationship with your woman will have long term. And it's a huge ripple effect. It'll go through the ages. It'll impact the relationships your kids have with their significant others someday. It'll start a trend. And if you've been raised in a household where that trend wasn't there, you can be the one who comes along and sets it right. You can do that as a man. I'll tell you what, we're running out of time, but I'm going to kick myself if I don't ask you about what you've written down here as the simple trick that makes arguing nearly impossible. I'm on pins and needles. Tell me. Yeah. And that goes back to this connection habit. So I'm going to give credit to Jenny that she started this idea when we were first married. She said, Jed, once the kids go to bed, that's our time. That's when we're going to connect. And so we started this early on. Kids would go to bed and we would watch a movie together. We'd sit out by the bonfire together. We'd have a dessert. We'd play a board game. You know, some nights we're just so exhausted. We're crashing on the couch watching movies. But really the key is, is no work, no cell phones. It's us time. And there's times where there's an argument, there's a disagreement and it lingers and it starts to carry on. Kids go to bed. And neither one of us know what to do after that point. Because it's like, we're supposed to be mad at each other, but we're always together. Like, this is us time. It just feels weird. And both of us are like, okay, how are we going to reconnect? Because this is what we do. 
This is what evenings are set aside for, and it's what's supposed to happen. And now it's just become so ingrained that kids go to bed. We're done with the arguments. You know, there's a book that's called Men Are Like Waffles, Women Are Like Spaghetti. And I've learned to use that waffle reflex that I have, which is really to compartmentalize, put things in a box. And that disagreement, it's done. It's on pause. We're now reconnecting. We're together. And if we're still frustrated and there's some lingering stuff going on, we might not even talk about it. We're just going to sit next to each other on the couch, watch a movie, maybe hold hands, maybe start to cuddle. But we're going to focus on all that's right in our relationship now. And I've learned that a lot of times you know, things just look so much brighter in the morning. And if we're connected in the evening, we wake up in the morning, sometimes the solution just seems to come overnight and it's a new day. If not, you know, we're going to figure it out, whether it's hours down the road, days down the road, weeks down the road. But the whole thing is we're going to have those moments of happy connection while we figure it out. I'll tell you what, in our house, that kind of situation is usually solved by, hey, honey, how about I give you multiple squirting orgasms till you scream? <laughs> that usually solves, you know, the underlying simmering anger after the kids go to bed. I will also add to that, you're calling this a simple trick. The not so simple trick is getting the kids to go to bed. Yes. But yeah, I hear you. And in the case of Emily and I, we definitely love our couple time together. It's like a little mini date night every night once we finally get the kids to go to bed. And yeah, sometimes we're exhausted. And no, we don't screw each other's brains out very shortly after the kids go to bed. Sometimes we wait for the morning. <laughs> but um, yeah, man, I completely am on board with everything you just said. And I appreciate this conversation. What I want to do right now, Jed, is send the guys over to your website where they can find out more about you and your work and communicating better as a couple, whether they're in a relationship now or not. I mean, it's good planning how to run your relationship as a man so that you have good, solid connection with a woman. And I will point guys to this URL so they can find out more about your work. And that's www.mountaintoppodcast.com front slash JJ. Let's just do JJ, man. We've had another Jed on this show, so JJ this time around, guys. And also, I'm going to add your books, 131 Creative Conversations for Couples and Joyfully Married, which is a great book, to my Amazon Influencer page where they'll be in that online library forever. So you guys can grab a copy of one or both of those books by going to mountaintoppodcast.com front slash Amazon and uh, get you some. Jed, what a great conversation. It's it's obvious you've done your homework on this. You're a world-class expert on the subject. And best of all, in my estimation, you actually walk the talk with your own wife and your own life. So uh, great, man. Thank you so much for joining us today. Scott, thank you. It was a lot of fun. I sure appreciate you having me on the show. Yeah, man, it has been a lot of fun. Time has flown. And guys, if you have not been to mountaintoppodcast.com recently, I invite you to go over there, click on the button in the upper right-hand corner where you can sign up in real time, get on my schedule and talk to me free for 25 minutes about what's on your mind. I love talking to you guys. You're going to find out that I'm exactly who you expect me to be. I'm down to earth. And I love making the acquaintance of you guys when you call me and uh, spend some time with me on the phone. We can talk about where you are right now, where you want to be, and possibly put a plan of action together to get you from here to there. That's all there for you at mountaintoppodcast.com. Want to give a shout out to our sponsors, Origin in Maine. If you do not yet have a pair of their factory jeans, you are missing out on the most stylish and functional jeans that will fit better than any you've ever owned. I promise you that. Go to mountaintoppodcast.com front slash origin and enter the coupon code Mountain10 for an instant 10% off. You can also enter Mountain10 when you go to mountaintoppodcast.com front slash hero soap and get some soap that makes you smell like a million bucks. Maybe not literally, but you know what I mean. Money is kind of dirty and stinky, but you'll smell fantastic and masculine for the women in your life. They'll take notice. And all the while, it's healthy soap. So it doesn't feminize you or do any of these horrible things you've heard that industrial soaps and shampoos do to you. Finally, I want to mention the good guys over at Keyport. If you do not have your absolutely killer everyday carry device, courtesy of Keyport, yet it's time. Go to www.mountaintoppodcast.com front slash keyport. And again, you can use Mountain 10 to get 10% off that order. And until I talk to you again real soon, this is Scott McKay from X and Y Communications in San Antonio, Texas. Be good out there. Oh.
the Mountaintop Podcast is produced by X and Y Communications. All rights reserved worldwide. Be sure to visit www.mountaintoppodcast.com for show notes. And while you're there, sign up for the free X and Y Communications newsletter for men. This is Ed Roy Odom speaking for the Mountaintop Podcast.